Okay, we're almost finished with our discussion of the conservation of momentum. And just to recap, uh, last time we obtained this system of nonlinear partial differential equations called the Navier-Stokes equations. And this just basically represents uh, Newton's law of motion, Newton's second law of motion applied to a fluid element. The time rate of change in momentum uh, in the fluid element, which is uh, the accumulation term and the flow term, is equal to the sum of the forces on the fluid element. And here we have uh, gravity and uh, shear stresses, and we've broken the shear stresses to separate out uh, the pressure term, which is the normal stress term. And we used a constitutive equation to relate stress and deformation in the fluid. And so we assumed it was a Newtonian fluid. That's the constitutive relationship that we applied here. And what I'm showing here is also, also subject to the uh, assumption that the fluid is incompressible. So I just want to make a, a few comments about, about uh, the Navier-Stokes equation since uh, they're very important. We're going to be using them throughout the course. Uh, another thing we can do um, you know, to simplify the, uh, the way these are written is to express them in, in vector form. And so that's, that's what's shown here. So I can collapse uh, all three of these components' equations into one equation by instead of writing the individual u, v, and w velocity components in the x, y, and z direction, I can just write the vector v. So rho times the substantial derivative of the velocity vector with respect to time equals uh, rho times the gravity vector g minus the gradient of the scalar field of pressure plus mu times this quantity del squared of the vector v. So this quantity del squared uh, is another operator, and so that represents the dot product between two del operators. And so this, this returns a scalar because it's a dot product. And written out in terms of components, at least Cartesian coordinates, del squared of something is equal to the second derivative, second partial derivative of something with respect to x, plus the second partial derivative of something with respect to y, plus the second partial derivative of something with respect to z. And you can see that that, that represents the kind of terms that we have uh, in, uh, in, in the third uh, term on the right-hand side of the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, so these, these expressions can all be collapsed into this, into this vector form expression. And sometimes this operator, this del squared operator, is referred to as the Laplacian. So this is a shorthand notation. If you see this in a book, you know, you may be more likely to see something written like this than to be written out in, in terms of all three components just because it saves space. So, but it's exactly the same equation. That, that's what I wanted to point out here, no matter how, how you see it written. It's saying expressing exactly the same thing. Okay, another important thing, uh, actually very important thing that I wanted to point out uh, to and, and spend a little time on is this issue of scaling uh, of these equations. So often uh, you'll see throughout uh, engineering, physics, it's useful to write systems of, of equations like this in, an, in a non-dimensional form. And the reason for that is that you can then obtain kind of a master equation that is independent of the, the particular length scales or quantities or, or, or parameters that are associated with a particular problem. Uh, why is that useful? Well, that means that you can just solve a, a general form of the equation and then uh, plug in later your specific parameters, your specific values of things like viscosity or, or length scales or, or things like that. So uh, that way, you know, people can can study the mathematical solution to the problem in a general sense, and then that general solution can be applied to specific problems later. So you don't have to resolve the, the whole system of equations every time you have a new, uh, a new problem. Okay, so uh, how would we do that? How would we apply that idea to the Navier-Stokes equation? So I'm going to uh, propose uh, some characteristic uh, scales uh, that we can talk about. So imagine that we have a flow with some characteristic velocity, capital V, and some object is involved in that flow. It could be either flow over an object, like I'm showing here, or flow through a pipe or some other object. Uh, so, and, and the size scale of that object is, is denoted by some length scale L. So it's just some characteristic size. So for a pipe, it might be the diameter of a pipe. Uh, for flow over some object, it might be, again, some characteristic size scale related to that object. Uh, and the details don't matter. It's just some some general uh, general idea of, of the, the overall size scale of the of the object or the, the the length scales involved and the velocity field. 
Okay, now with these characteristic scales in mind, we can then use them to non-dimensionalize the parameters that appear in the Navier-Stokes equation. So for example, uh, velocity. We have the velocity vector v, remember from the vector form. So if we divide the velocities, all the velocity components in the equation by this characteristic scale, capital V, then we can call that new vector that would contain all those components uh, v star. Similarly, you know, all these derivatives with respect to length, partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, partial with respect to z, we can non-dimensionalize those. Those have units of 1 over length, so we can non-dimensionalize those by multiplying them by length. And then this del star would represent the um, dimensionless form. Similarly for the Laplacian, is we're taking the second derivative with respect to a length scale, uh, so that has units of 1 over length squared. So if we multiply it by length squared, then we get this quantity del star that's, that's unitless. And then uh, what about the pressure? So we can normalize that by some characteristic uh, force per unit area. And I'm going to suggest that we use this quantity, uh, the viscosity mu, times V over L. And why am I choosing that? Well, that's uh, representative of a characteristic shear stress. And remember when we looked at the flow between parallel plates uh, in one of the earlier videos, uh, this, this collection of terms emerged uh, just to express that, that very simple flow field. So, and, and we use that to, to get an expression for Newton's law of viscosity. So if you go back and look at Newton's law of viscosity in, in terms of the flow between parallel plates, uh, this is kind of the general form uh, of that. So it gives us a general scale for the magnitudes or the forces or the stresses that, that we would want to consider in this flow field. So that's why we're going to choose that as a characteristic value uh, to normalize the pressure. And you know, they both have units of force per unit area. So P star is the characteristic uh, value of, of, the, of the pressure that's unitless. Okay, so we have all these non-dimensional parameters and, and we're going to ignore for now the, the gravity effects in the flow. Okay, so now we can take these dimensionless uh, parameters that we just came up with and substitute them into the Navier-Stokes equation. So let me go to the next slide and do that. So let me again write uh, the vector form of the Navier-Stokes equation here. Uh, this is just what I showed you on the first slide, uh, the shorthand notation. You can see now why we want to write use the shorthand notation because I just have to write one, one equation here to represent everything. And then these are the dimensionless uh, quantities that we just uh, proposed uh, on the previous slide. So I'm going to assume that the flow is steady state uh, just, to, just to illustrate the key points here. So that means that in this uh, substantial derivative, I can eliminate the first term, which is the partial derivative of rho with respect to time. So I deliver, uh, uh, you know, I, I could consider that later and define a characteristic time scale, but for for what I want to show you right now, that's that's not as important. So I'm going to assume steady state. Uh, so this is what's left. Uh, you know, this is the term that's left from the substantial derivative when I eliminate the the partial derivative with respect to time. So now we can go in and try to substitute in these these dimensionless quantities. So I want to solve them for the dimensional quantity in terms of the dimensionless quantity. So V uh, is equal to capital V times V star. Uh, the dimensional uh, del operator is equal to 1 over L times the dimensionless del operator. Uh, the Laplacian is equal to 1 over L squared times the dimensionless Laplacian. And if I solve this for pressure, that's equal to the dimensionless pressure times mu V over L. So then if I substitute these quantities here into the Navier-Stokes equation, I can do that. And so I get some, some constants. So again, I have rho, uh, right? The vector v is uh, v, the characteristic velocity, times v star. So I substitute that in. Wherever I have a del, I substitute 1 over l del star v. I substitute v, v star, and so on. So I can go through all of these terms and substitute in uh, the, uh, basically just substitute in these quantities here. Uh, into the equation. And this is what I have left. So I have the dimensionless uh, velocity field and operators, uh, the del operators, and the Laplacian. And then I also have some constants uh, that represent these characteristic scales. So I can group those together uh, as follows below. So I'm just collecting terms here. right? So I have v times 1 over l times another v. So that gives me v squared over l times rho. On the left hand side, uh, and multiplying the pressure, I have mu v over l, and then another 1 over l. So I have mu v over l squared, and I have the same term also in the, in the um, 
in the second term on the right hand side. So now I'm going to multiply both sides by this quantity L squared over mu times V. And so when I do that I can see that that's going to cancel these two terms because that's what I have in common for both terms on the right hand side and then I'll multiply uh, what uh, the collection of terms on the left hand side also times L squared over mu V. So I'm multiplying the left and right hand side by the same thing. It doesn't change the value of the, uh, of the, uh, of the equation. Okay, so what I'm left with, right, these cancel out and then, uh, then I combine this term uh, with L squared over mu V and I'll do that here on the next slide. So this is what I have left. On the left hand side I have my dimensionless uh, v dot del v and all that term is multiplied by this uh, collection of, of scales rho v l over mu and then on the left hand side I just have uh, the same thing that I had for the dimensional form except it's in terms of the dimensionless variables p star v star del star and del squared star so this is a dimensionless form of the Navier-Stokes equations and again you know if I remember uh, if we remember how we defined uh, uh, you know, these terms, what they mean, these terms on the left-hand side represent the, the momentum uh, flow terms, so these are uh, related to the flow or inertia. And these terms are related uh, to the shear stresses, uh, so we call these the viscous terms. Now, notice this term on the left-hand side. This is just a constant. It's a collection of these characteristic quantities. And this constant has a special name. It's called the Reynolds number. And so the Reynolds number is a very important parameter, uh, right? So it's rho, rho VL over mu, density times the characteristic velocity times the characteristic length scale over the fluid viscosity. And what it represents physically is this ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces. So this parameter tells us the relative importance of the left-hand side of the equation to the right hand side of the equation where the left hand side represents the flow or inertia terms and the right hand side represents the viscous terms that come from remember these come from the constitutive relationship uh, in our case Newton's law of viscosity that relates stress to deformation so the Reynolds number is a fundamentally important parameter and it comes directly from the Navier-Stokes equations and it tells us a lot about what's going on in the flow now remember that we assumed uh, that these uh, the pressure uh, sort of had the same order of magnitude as the as the viscous terms because we chose uh, sort of the viscous shear stress to uh, normalize uh, the magnitude of the pressure. So that it sort of it, the the two are related in in, the, in in terms of the scales that we used for this normalization. Okay, so. The Reynolds number tells us what forces dominate in the flow. And this is very important uh, for us to be able to see. So for example, if the Reynolds number is small. So if this term is small, the left-hand side of this equation is much smaller relative to the right-hand side. So we can it essentially can be neglected relative to the magnitude of the right-hand side. And so here, viscous forces dominate. And this is uh, called a creeping flow, or sometimes it's called a Stokes flow regime. So in this regime, uh, you know, this represents a situation that you would encounter with very viscous fluids or at very small length scales, right? For the Reynolds number to be small, viscosity can be very large, or the length scale can be very small. So you encounter this, for example, in flows of, of uh, you know, polymer melts, polymer solutions that are very viscous, or you know, flows involving small, uh, small length scales, either through small, small diameter pipes, uh, or flows over small objects like dust particles, uh, things like that. Now, the opposite limit would be the case where the Reynolds number is large. So in that case, inertial forces dominate. So the left-hand side of the equation is much more important than the right-hand side. And so basically, you know, considering the relative magnitudes, then the right-hand side terms uh, 
uh, can be neglected with respect to the left-hand side term. So we neglect the viscous terms. And so this represents what we would often call the inviscid regime. Uh, so here, you know, the bulk flow uh, is, is an area where we could apply this, for example, um, you know, away from surfaces we might say that maybe we can assume that the flow is inviscid because these viscous effects are generally localized uh, near the near boundaries. And they're generally localized in what's called the boundary layer. So depending on the nature of the flow, we may be able to apply this kind of limit or assume that, uh, that this kind of limit applies in the bulk of the flow away from a surface. Okay, so this scaling of the Navier-Stokes equations and the Reynolds number are actually very important practically uh, in terms of, for example, aeronautics or, or engineering where you're trying to uh, capture phenomena at one length scale by representing them at another length scale. So an example is wind tunnel testing, you know, of an airplane or, or a car. Maybe you don't want to build a you know, full-size model uh, of, that, uh, of that system to do some experiments uh, to get some idea about the, the flow field around that, uh, around that kind of uh, configuration may not be practical to build a full size model. So you may want to build a smaller size model and how would you be able to then adjust the flow field to get uh, you know, similar conditions that would exist in the large size scale. And so the Reynolds number is one way, uh, one parameter that can be used to adjust that. So for example, if you want to make a half scale model uh, and have the same kind of flow field or an equivalent flow field, then your uh, flow velocity would need to be increased by a factor of two so that you could match the Reynolds numbers and get you know, uh, flow conditions that would be more or less representative uh, at the small scale uh, of as what they are at the large scale. So that's one example of the Reynolds number. You, know, you can see that as we non-dimensionalize this equation, we can get solutions. And so that you know, any conditions where the Reynolds number is the same, any combination of these parameters that give the same Reynolds number should give the same flow field around the object. So that's, that's one, uh, one, one reason why the Reynolds number is important uh, in terms of applications. And the other thing that I really want to point out here that's very important is that this Reynolds number emerges directly from the physics. It comes from non-dimensionalization of the Navier-Stokes equations. So you can arrive, it, arrive at it uh, in other ways using just dimensional analysis by considering what parameters exist uh, in the problem and, and how many ways those could be arranged uh, independently. Uh, and, th and that's how that approach is used in many, uh, in many textbooks. But uh, for me, this really uh, makes a lot more sense because it really shows the connection to the physics.